Another Holy Narcissist. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Many people experience narcissism in an intimate relationship or as a consequence of a family member. Those are the most two common occurrences. More widely, some people experience it in a neighbour, a colleague, a friend, perhaps somebody that they know through a group. But it's usually through an intimate relationship or a family member that people come to the world of narcissism. However, understanding narcissism and narcissists has a greater applicability in the wider world because it helps you understand why certain people behave as they do. It helps you understand why world leaders make the decisions that they do. It helps you understand why politicians engage in the behaviours that they do. It helps you realise why prominent actors and actresses are the way that they are, sports people. That it enables you to understand why certain individuals behave in self-centred and self-absorbed behaviour, or where they engage in self-destructive behaviour, where you find yourself asking, who on earth does that? Why, when they got the world at their feet, did they go and implode like that? Invariably, narcissism is involved in understanding the political persuasions, the grasping nature of famous individuals, by understanding narcissism, you're given a key to understanding so much of human behaviour. Many people email me explaining that after they have embraced understanding narcissism as a consequence of a personal matter, it's helped them understand so much about the world as a whole. And that's one of the brilliant aspects of my work. Not only will it give you the key to achieving freedom vis-a-vis -vis your own personal narcissist or narcissist, it will then bring enlightenment to you in understanding the way that much of the world works. From time to time, I provide you with examples of individuals in the world at large so that you can understand why it is they behave they wear, the way that they do. And here we have another example which involves a holy narcissist. There is the video, The Holy Narcissist, which explains why religion is so attractive to those in the clergy as a means of getting to the prime aims. The utilisation of an imaginary friend or a powerful entity as somehow being on the side of the member of the clergy is a powerful means to control people. You only have to look back through history to see the way that the religion has controlled the masses. It allows the extraction of fuel in substantial amounts, character trait acquisition, and of course keen residual benefits, mostly by the operation of a facade and access to money, for example. I provided you with other examples of holy narcissists demonstrating the way that they behave so that you can understand that they utilize religion and some entity, some other being, some supreme being, as a means to enable them to get to the prime aims. Religion is probably one of the most powerful vehicles that is available for misuse by narcissists. And here, I'm providing you with another example in relation to a man called T.B. Joshua. This is reported by the BBC by Charlie Northcott and Helen Spooner. Evidence of widespread abuse and torture by the founder of one of the world's biggest Christian evangelical churches has been uncovered by the BBC. Dozens of ex-synagogue Church of All Nations members, five British, allege atrocities including rape and forced abortions by Nigeria's late T.B. Joshua. Naturally, allegations of rape shows an absence of emotional thinking with sexual violence. I beg your pardon, shows an absence of emotional empathy, shows sexual violence, and is a brutal means of controlling and drawing fuel. Forcing someone to undergo an abortion is also the assertion of control and an absence of emotional empathy. It also demonstrates a lack of accountability for this individual's behaviours. The allegations of abuse in a secretive Lagos compound span almost 20 years. This demonstrates a sustained period of the same behaviours supporting that they are pathological in nature. The Synagogue Church of All Nations did not respond to the allegations, but said previous claims 
have been unfounded. T.B. Joshua, who died in 2021, was a charismatic and hugely successful preacher and televangelist who had an immense global following. Thus, he has the charisma to draw people in and has a massive fuel matrix by virtue of having an immense global following. The BBC's findings over a two-year investigation include dozens of eyewitness accounts of physical violence, rudimentary manipulation, or torture carried out by Joshua, including instances of child abuse and people being whipped and chained, assertion of control, lack of emotional empathy. Numerous women who say they were repeatedly sexually assaulted by Joshua, with a number claiming they were repeatedly raped for years inside the compound. My earlier points apply. Multiple allegations of forced abortions inside the church, following the alleged rapes by Joshua, including one woman who says she had five terminations. Earlier points about abortions are applicable. Multiple first-hand accounts detailing how Joshua faked his miracle healings lie, deceit, which were broadcast to millions of people around the world. One of the victims, a British woman called Ray, was 21 years old when she abandoned her degree at Brighton University in 2002 and was recruited into the church. She spent the next 12 years as one of Joshua's so-called disciples inside his maze-like concrete compound in Lagos. We all thought we were in heaven, but we were in hell. And in hell, terrible things happened, she told the BBC. Note the brainwashing that has occurred as a consequence of the seduction at the outset of the relationship to cause her to believe that she was in heaven. Ray says she was sexually assaulted, lack of boundary recognition, absence of emotional empathy, by Joshua, and subjected to a form of solitary confinement for two years, isolation. The abuse was so severe... She says she attempted suicide multiple times inside the compound. The Synagogue Church of All Nations, Scoen, has a global following, operating a Christian TV channel called Emmanuel TV and social media networks with millions of viewers. Throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, tens of thousands of pilgrims from Europe, the Americas, Southeast Asia and Africa travelled to the church in Nigeria to witness Joshua performing healing miracles showmanship, part of his grandiosity, assertion of control. At least 150 visitors lived with him as disciples inside his compound in Lagos, sometimes for decades. Extensive fuel matrix. More than 25 former disciples spoke to the BBC from the United Kingdom, Nigeria, the United States, South Africa, Ghana, Namibia and Germany, giving powerful corroborating testimony about their experiences within the church, with the most recent experiences in 2019. Many victims were in their teens when they first joined. In some of the British cases, their transport to Lagos was paid for by Joshua Bribery, in coordination with other UK churches. Ray and multiple other interviewees compared their experiences to being in a cult. Jessica Kaimu from Namibia says her ordeal lasted more than five years. She says she was 17 when Joshua first raped her, and that subsequent instances of rape by TB Joshua led to her having five forced abortions while there. These were backdoor type medical treatments that were going through, could have killed us, she told us the BBC. Other interviewees say they were stripped and beaten with electrical cables and horsewhips and routinely denied sleep, physical violence, sleep deprivation, both as a means to assert control and draw fuel. On his death in June 2021, T.B. Joshua was hailed as one of the most influential pastors in, Amer- in African history. Rising from poverty, he built an evangelical empire that counted dozens of political leaders, celebrities and international footballers among his associates. He did, however, attract some controversy during his lifetime when a guest house for church pilgrims collapsed in 2014, killing at least 116 people. The BBC's investigation, which was carried out with international media platform Open Democracy, is the first time multiple former church insiders have come forward to speak on the record. They say they've spent years trying to raise the alarm, but have effectively been silenced. 
That silencing, of course, is necessary to nullify the threat to control to TB Joshua that's posed by these accounts from the various victims. A number of witnesses in Nigeria claim they were physically attacked, use of physical violence for the purpose of assertion of control, and in one case shot at. After previously speaking out against the abuse and posting videos containing allegations on YouTube, a BBC crew that attempted to record footage of the church's Lagos compound from a public street in March 2022 was also fired at by the church's security and was detained for a number of hours. The BBC contacted SCOAN with the allegations in our investigation. It did not respond to them, but denied previous claims against TB Joshua. Undoubtedly, members of the coterie or lieutenants issuing a denial on his behalf to nullify the threat to control. Making unfounded allegations against Prophet TB Joshua is not a new occurrence. None of the allegations was ever substantiated, it wrote. Four of the British citizens who spoke to the BBC say they reported the abuse to the UK authorities after escaping the church. They say no further action was taken. In addition, a British man and his wife emailed eyewitness accounts of their ordeal and video evidence, including recordings of being held at gunpoint by men describing themselves as police, who are also members of SCOAN, to the British High Commission in Nigeria in March 2010 after fleeing the church. In his email, the man said his wife had been repeatedly sexually assaulted and raped by Joshua, sexual violence, lack of emotional empathy, lack of boundary recognition. He warned the commission that other British nationals were still inside the compound facing atrocities. He also says no action was taken. Scoan continues to thrive today under the leadership of Joshua's widow, Evelyn. In July 2023, she led a tour of Spain. Annika, who left Derby in the United Kingdom to join Scoan at the age of 17, told the BBC she believes there are many other victims who have yet to speak out. She hopes further steps will be taken to uncover Joshua's actions. I believe the Synagogue Church of All Nations needs a thorough investigation into why this man was able to function for so long in the way that he did, she said. Another aspect to the behaviour of TB Joshua was the healings and supposed demonstration of his self-professed divine powers. His belief that he had divine powers is demonstrative of the magical thinking of a narcissist. He utilises these supposed divine powers for the purpose of asserting control over the audience, drawing fuel by way of their reaction, and then naturally utilising it to receive donations, etc., which is a residual benefit. Joshua's meteoric rise to fame was closely tied to these divine powers and his supposed ability to heal the sick. The theatrical healings, showing the physically disabled walking and on one occasion purporting to resurrect a dead person, were filmed. They were then sent on VHS tapes to churches across the world. In 2004, Nigeria's broadcast regulator banned stations from airing the supposed miracles of pastors on live terrestrial TV, prompting Joshua to launch Emmanuel TV on satellite and then online. Accordingly, the banning was a threat to control. He therefore sought to nullify that threat to control by opening his own TV channel. His global television and social media empire became one of the most successful Christian networks in the world. However, Joshua, who died in 2021, age 57, was actually a fraud. There are various ways, six ways, in which he tricked worshippers. The first was the emergency department. An exclusive section of the church, named the emergency department, was responsible for making the so-called miracles look real. This is where the sick who came to be healed would be screened, and where the team would decide who should be filmed and prayed for by Joshua. Agamoa Paul, who supervised the department for 10 years, received direct instructions from Joshua. He told the BBC that the team was trained by medical doctors. He's a former disciple, one of an elite group of dedicated followers who lived with the pastor inside the Scoan compound, undoubtedly a lieutenant. 
any cancerous situation, they send them away. Then people who had normal open wounds that can heal, they bring them in to present as cancer, he says. Only a select group of trusted disciples were allowed to work in the emergency department, i.e. people that were clearly under control and would do what Joshua wanted. They would write placards for each follower to hold, detailing their made-up or exaggerated ailments. When it was time to meet Joshua, they would stand in line in front of the cameras and be healed. It was a complicated system. Not all disciples knew what was happening. It was a secret, Mr. Paul says. Thus, deceit, making it seem like he has magical powers. 2. Drugs. Every foreign visitor who came to the church to be healed had to fill out a medical report detailing their illness and the medication they were currently prescribed. They would be told to stop taking them, lack of emotional empathy, but Joshua would order pharmacists to procure the same medicine. Without their knowledge, they would put those drugs in their fruit drinks, explained Mr. Paul, who said people would be urged to drink the cocktail that had been blessed, grandiosity, by Joshua. This meant while visitors were residing at Scoan, they would not become unwell, and therefore they were duped into believing the divine healing powers of their pastor. In the 1990s, when HIV and AIDS had reached epidemic levels across parts of sub-Saharan Africa, Joshua told visitors to stop taking their medication when they returned home. Lack of emotional empathy. I know people died because they didn't take their medicine and it's difficult to live with that, admits a former disciple who asked not to be named. South African Tash Ford, now 49, went to Lagos in 2001 in the hope of having her failing kidney healed, but was told to stop taking her drugs. It was the promised, promise gain, that you could supernaturally receive a new kidney, she told the BBC. At the time, she'd already had two kidney transplants. Miss Ford says the disciples said, stop taking your medication and just believe. So, she did believe she'd been healed, but when she got home after four weeks of not taking her medicine, she went into renal failure and was admitted to hospital. The medics initially managed to save her kidney, but eventually it stopped working, and she had to have kidney dialysis for more than six years before having a third transplant in 2011. 3. Brainwashing Mr. Ford says when she was at... Sorry, Ms. Ford says when she was at Scoan, she never had any doubts. I honestly thought we were seeing miracles. I literally couldn't believe what I was seeing. I saw someone walk out of a wheelchair. The theatricality seemed to draw everyone in. The former disciple told the BBC that after being screened, the chosen followers would be told to exaggerate their problems so that God can heal you and exaggerate your healing. Lie. The people themselves are clearly being manipulated, she says. The church had a ready supply of wheelchairs, which followers were coaxed to use. They were warned they would not be healed unless they sat in one when they met Joshua. We are telling them, if you come out there and walk with your legs, Papa will not pray for you. You need to shout, Man of God, help me, I cannot walk, says Mr. Paul. Another former disciple, Bissola, who spent 14 years living at Scoan, accompanied Joshua on his national healing campaign at the Church of Our Saviour in Singapore in 2006. She says she saw people in wheelchairs try to stand up after the pastor told the congregation he had released faith into the stadium. Magical thinking, grandiosity. The emergency department workers themselves were also being manipulated. They were subject to horrifying ordeals, including rape, physical violence and torture, and lived by a strict set of rules, forbidden to sleep for more than a few hours at time, sleep deprivation, method of control. Now they struggle to understand how and why they continue to follow the pastor's orders. TB Joshua told me, don't worry, we use this thing to build people's faith in Christ. I wasn't having in mind that I was actually doing something wrong. I thought I was doing something that would help to build the faith of people in the church, says Mr. Paul. Bribes, number four. Some disciples allege they were charged with finding people who needed money to pretend to be sick. Exploitation of vulnerability. When they performed healing crusades in countries outside Nigeria, they would go to the poorer areas of a city to search for people living in poverty. We would say, we need you to just act out this particular scene, and we will pay you, another former disciple told the BBC. 
We get them into hotels, we get them cleaned up, they come, they do what they do, we give them their money and the rest is history. Before the service they would tell Joshua which rows they had planted these people and what clothes they were wearing so he would know who to perform his supposed miracles on. 5. Fake Medical Certificates the healing miracles broadcast to millions regularly included medical reports stating people had been cured of HIV, AIDS and diseases like cancer. Doctors were interviewed on camera confirming the cures. In 2000, Nigerian journalist Ajuan Sayenka reported that these medical certificates were fake, but Joshua quashed his investigation, nullification of threat to control, and it went nowhere. To this day, some people believe they were healed, but actually it was just a performance. The whole thing is stage-managed and faked. It's fake, says Mr. Paul, describing Joshua as an evil genius. There was nothing that took place in the compound that Joshua did not know about, he explains. TB Joshua was the one who masterminded the whole manipulation, he says. 6. Video Manipulation The miracles were filmed and then edited to make it look like the supposed healing had happened instantaneously. Before and after footage was spliced together to show his purported miraculous powers, but in reality the films were shot months or even a year apart. All you see on TV is the before and after. You don't know the time space, says Bisola, who was Scone's chief video editor for five years and worked on Emmanuel TV. What people see is not real. It's a fraud, she says, about the clips and broadcasts she oversaw. Anything they didn't want the viewers to see was cut away. It was all organised. TV Joshua's church that he utilised as a cult and enabled him through the apparent issuing of healing, supposed healing powers and divine powers, to assert control over millions of followers around the world. Their responses all provided him with huge amounts of fuel, as they no doubt praised and worshipped him for what he was doing. He took advantage of those that were in the compound, engaging in physical and sexual violence towards them, demonstrating his absence of emotional empathy and sense of entitlement, treating those people as objects. He operated a facade to the outside world of this healer, that this prophet, while all the while he was engaging in acts, devaluing people repeatedly on a daily basis. This gave him access to money to enjoy a particular lifestyle and residual benefit. And once again, a clear narcissist exhibiting sense of entitlement, a lack of emotional empathy, a lack of accountability, grandiosity, magical thinking, haughty behaviours, various manipulative behaviours, no boundary recognition, various aspects of the narcissistic dynamic, utilises religion as that means of getting to the prime aims. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.